She's the owner of the bikery. She asked me about why it's called the bikery, so yes. maybe you can go into your story. So then. the bikery started back in 2019. Uh, it was just me on a bike with a box on the back, and I sold pretzels. I would uh, rent out some kitchen space, and I loaded up some pretzels into the back of the bike, and I would just tour around the city. Uh, people would wave me down on the side of the street. I would open up the box, sell them a pretzel, and that sort of thing. Uh, when the pandemic hit and everybody was stuck at home, we started updating the menu. So we started doing uh, breads and pastas and tried out a bunch of different things and, uh, and we had updated the menu and that sort of thing. Uh, we started uh, doing a lot of orders with the challah, which is uh, what we've kind of gotten known for now, challah and bagels. Uh, the Jewish community took note and so we started really ramping up. Uh, we do, it's now Shabbat, so we do a very busy Friday every Shabbat. And so uh, here we are now, we've uh, got a space and we still have our bike that we use for deliveries. Uh, you can see that in the back of the shot there. but. Um, we're economically, uh, environmentally impacted. Our oven is completely electric. We use electric car for deliveries. This bike has an electric battery in it now to give it a little more oomph. Uh, so the Victoria Public Market is really starting to grow because all of these people who live in this neighborhood will visit here. Whereas back in the day, this was kind of out, a little bit out of town. Out of town, uh, but now it's definitely in the heart of it all. Uh, so yeah, it's a really uh, it's a great kind of opportunity to get a bunch of local businesses all in one location. So all of the vendors that are in here are all small independent businesses doing their own thing. Victoria is really famous for being a farm to table city. Like we've been doing farm to table long before that term got cool and sexy. We live on an island, shipping things over costs more money, and we just have a really unique growing region here so we can access unique food. So farm to table is a big part of the culinary culture of Victoria. Thank you so much. You're so very welcome. Enjoy the rest of your tour. Cheers. We started with our downtown food and city tour, uh, and then we knew that Chinatown was really up and coming. We'll go over more about the kind of waves of Chinatown, but I would argue in the last 10 years, it's, it's very much changed. It's very modern. It's not necessarily Chinese-focused businesses. You've got, as you'll see when we walk through, we're gonna try some Mexican cuisine, we're gonna try some French cuisine, uh, a new German place just moved in. So uh, like all cultures are being represented, but there still is, of course, some amazing Chinese businesses down there as well. Um, but a lot of young, modern businesses are moving into the area, and I think it kind of gave it a bit of a boost, revitalized the neighborhood a little bit. Some new buildings kind of went down. They, they kind of gutted a few of the really old ones and, and redid them. So, uh, yeah, the Chinatown here has so much history, um, and that part of it, of course, is really exciting to have that here. Um, but then you mix in some really great modern businesses. I think it really lends to being a really interesting tour. Um, but yeah, La Pasta La Pizza, uh, they're fabulous. We'll definitely go there next. Uh, we're gonna try a little Italian sample. Uh, they've been in business now for, well, since the market opened in 2013. So the, the market itself, the building itself, uh, started in the early 1900s, uh, but the market itself started in 1913. And uh, these guys are one of the flagship stores. Nice to meet you guys. I uh, hope you're having a good tour so far. My name is Jesse. I'm the chef and manager here at La Pasta. Today I prepared for you some arancini. So these are uh, a little Italian cicchetti or snack. Uh, they originated in the 10th century in Sicily. And the word arancini means little orange in Italian. They look like little oranges when they're all ready to eat there and prepared. But uh, that's about the only similarity. They're a little more savory than oranges. These are fried risotto balls. So it's going to be rice inside of there that we're tasting. Uh, traditionally, this is just going to be leftover risotto. Um, the next day, Nona kind of roll them into little balls, uh, bread them with some breadcrumbs, and fry them up, and just serve them kind of just like that. Uh, but we, uh, we make the risotto just for this dish here. Um, so we start out with a pot with some olive oil. We get that uh, nice and hot. We add some diced garlic and onion. Uh, we kind of cook that around, saute it, and cook some of the moisture out of the aromatics. And that starts to get a really nice flavor going in the pot. And then we take our rice, which is our borio rice. So it's a short grain Italian rice, very densely packed with starch. 
Uh, perfect for this process. And you kind of just toast it off in there with the olive oil and the garlic and the onion. Uh, get a little bit of color on the rice before you add in your wine. And we, it's called deglazing and we deglaze the whole pot. So we kind of add the liquid in there. The acid is the first thing that the rice absorbs. So it gets a really nice flavor kind of going there with the olive oil. It loosens everything up in the pot. Uh, it just starts off the flavor of the dish super, super uh, nicely. Uh, we throw some bay leaves in there as well. Uh, we begin to ladle in, uh, about a ladle at a time, uh, veggie broth. So we use veggie broth for this. Uh, of course, you can use any kind of broth that you like. It's such a versatile thing. It just takes on the flavor of whatever you put in there. Uh, so we use veggie broth, and we also take the cheese uh, that's grated on top of there. It's called Grana Padano. Uh, and that is uh, similar to Parmesan cheese, but it's from a different region in Italy. Uh, it's aged a little bit less time, uh, not quite as sharp and intense, but still uh, kind of a dry, uh, kind of semi-granular cheese. Uh, and we take the rind, so the very end hard bit there that you can't really grate up, uh, and we just save those for every chunk that we get in. We save them, put them in the freezer. Then when we go to make our veggie broth, we add all of those chunks of rind into the, the pot, and when we heat up the broth, it takes on all that flavor of the cheese, and it saves you a lot of cost in the end. You don't have to add as much cheese to make it taste like Parmesan. Uh, and usually those just get tossed out, so it's a really good way to kind of like add some depth to your dish. Shortcut to, to getting a lot of flavor in there. It takes you like an hour almost to get the risotto done, then you gotta cool it overnight. The next day we add in some egg and breadcrumbs and roll them into little balls, and that helps the uh, fritter kind of stay together so it doesn't break apart, it kind of binds it up. And then we bread them with some, uh, some breadcrumbs uh, and fry it in canola oil. So we use canola oil because it doesn't smoke, has a lower smoke point, so uh, it's really good for frying at high heat. Uh, and then we serve it on top of our house-made marinara sauce on the bottom that we also make, of course. Uh, we do that with San Marzano tomatoes, so really nice canned tomato. Uh, we start the, the process in a very similar way with olive oil, some garlic, and diced onion. Uh, some chili flakes for a little bit of heat, just a subtle bit of heat there. And then a few hours to really slowly simmer it and allow it to sweeten up naturally. Uh, and then we puree the whole thing. And together you get a really nice balance of the acid from those tomatoes. Uh, that's what I really like about those tomatoes in particular. It's got a really nice acid and a sweetness as well. Um, and then you get the crispy kind of texture from the outside there and really soft and delicious in the middle. This is the Big Spoon. Uh, so they are most famous for their soup. So we are going to try one of their more, more famous soups. Hey, just two. Yes, please. Um, but of course, as a beautiful little bakery, they carry some baked goods. They do some lovely sandwiches. It's essentially a lunch joint. And then they kind of incorporated like a little shop in here. So if you live in the neighborhood and just need to pick up some things for your pantry. Uh, they also sell some local pantry items as well. Uh, this is Brandon and Linda's uh, place. They also own Shatterbox Coffee. They use crazy local ingredients. They make beautiful vegan soups. Uh, so this is actually fairly new. Uh, they only opened up this location a little less than a year ago. So it's, it's also kind of a new spot. So we, are, I believe, are gonna try the smoky, smoky corn chowder. Uh, we do grow a ton of corn here on the island. It's a big part of our economy and, and our farming. Um, and it's actually a vegan smoky corn chowder, so um, a great option for some vegans, which is a big, again, pretty popular here on the island. How Victoria started in modern day terms was a man by the name of James Douglas. Uh, so that is Douglas Street that's right out front there. James Bay is named after him. So James Douglas was working for the Hudson's Bay Company and he was the head of their fur trapping post in what was now known as Vancouver, Washington. So their original fur trapping post on the west coast was in Vancouver, Washington. And when we started to negotiate the 49th parallel between Canada and the US, they realized that their British company was going to be in American territory. So they tasked James Douglas with finding a more northern base. So he decided on Victoria for a few reasons, and I'll maybe get into that a little later down the line. Um, but essentially, he came to this island, he created Fort Victoria, which is down at Bastion Square. The original is no longer there. Uh, and was working for the Hudson's Bay Company and started Victoria, named it after the reigning queen. In 1858, gold was discovered. I'm gonna go into a lot more detail about the gold rush because that's how Chinatown started. Uh, but essentially the fort shuttered, they, they, they tore down the fort, and the Hudson's Bay Company became a warehouse. So they were essentially kitting out miners and fur trappers and coal miners were working here with gear. And, and they operated a warehouse down on the waterfront and that's what the Hudson's Bay became. And then at the turn of the century, in the early 1900s, the Hudson's Bay decided to turn themselves into a department store. So they tasked uh, the chairman of Harrods, which is a very famous department store in the UK, uh, to go across Canada and determine which cities would make a good location for these new department stores. So they chose Victoria as one of the original six locations. 
all of them are in kind of Western Canada, mostly like Ontario and West. Um, and they started building this building in 1909. They paused during the war and it was completed in 1921. So this was the Hudson's Bay department store. It was very similar to Harrods. It had a lot of departments. It was very luxurious. They had a mezzanine with an orchestra. They had a library. Uh, they did have a restaurant. Um, and yeah, it was just sort of seen as this gorgeous high-end department store that Victoria had never seen before. Well, Canada had never seen before. So it remained that way for many, many years, really up until about the 1990s. By the 1990s, this part of Victoria was really kind of in, you know, not not bustling, let's put it that way. There wasn't a lot of walk-in traffic. Most of the commerce had moved downtown. Most of business had moved into the downtown core. And so they were losing money by having a department store here. So the downtown mall uh, used to be called the Eaton Center. There was a department store there called Eaton's. Uh, Eaton's shuttered their doors and the Hudson's Bay moved in. So they moved in in 2003 and this building sat empty. But because it is a heritage building, they couldn't tear it down. So somebody bought it uh, called Townline. They were responsible for a lot of how Gastown looks in Vancouver. They did a lot of the work in Gastown. They bought this building, they gutted it, they created condos up at the top, and then they created this space down here which is now called the Victoria Public Market. They were using uh, Pike Place Market as inspiration, also Granville Island. So they knew it would be food dominant and they knew it would be these independent little foodie stalls. So it opened in 2013 uh, as the condo. It's, the building itself is referred to as the Hudson, Downstairs is called the Victoria Public Market. It was all the old Hudson's Bay department store space. Um, and then, yeah, this is now what it is today. So this is the Hudson's Bay Company um, emblem. Uh, as you can see uh, from the company started in 1670, so it is old. Uh, you can see a few animals on the ground there. So, uh, of course, that is a fox. Then, of course, you've got the beavers. Uh, and then this is technically a moose. But this logo was uh, designed in 1670. And they've never seen a moose before because the person that designed it lived in, in um, Britain. Uh, so it's kind of a weird looking moose. It's actually more of an elk. Um, that, that doesn't really, that's not what a moose looks like. <laughs> uh, but it was intended to be a moose. They had heard about this animal uh, here in Canada. Uh, the uh, Italian, um, sorry, the Latin uh, logo underneath there, Pro Pele Cutum, it translates into for the pelt's skin which is actually really morbid, because what they're essentially saying is that beaver pelts and animal pelts are worth almost more than human life. Oh, yeah. uh, so for the human skin. Life. So basically, uh, they were so, we'll take this light here. They were so, you know, the, the, the fur trapping and the beaver pelts was such an important part of their economy that they were willing to lose lives over it. And it was pretty gnarly work. I know very famously that, that movie, The Reverent with, um, Leonardo DiCaprio depicting what it was like. He was working for the Hudson's Bay's um, competitor, the Northwest Company, um, but essentially it was pretty hard work. Definitely entered into Chinatown. There's a few things that really stand out which make it fairly obvious. One, of course, is the color red, uh, being, of course, a very um, auspicious color, uh, brings sort of luck and wealth. Uh, that color is very important to them. Uh, you also see a repeating pattern on the sidewalk. Uh, we'll see that throughout as we walk down Fiskard Street. Um, that is the Cantonese word for longevity. So again, sort of adding some good spirits and good luck into the uh, community. Uh, I do, of course, want to talk about the building that's right behind us. It's the Chinese Public School, a beautiful historic site here. So I'll talk a bit more about this as we're walking because uh, I want to make sure we get to our next stop. But um, essentially, our Chinatown is the oldest in Canada and it has everything to do with the gold rush. So as I said, James Douglas came here in 1843 and opened up Fort Victoria as just a very small fur trapping community. And he brought with him maybe 200 Europeans and of course he encountered the native people that were living here, the called the Lekwungen people. And there was about, they estimate about 4,000 at the point of European contact. So he, Douglas was making treaties with them and just very much setting up a small community of farmers and fur trappers. And then a decade later, a little over in 1858, something happened that completely changed the trajectory, which is the gold rush. So when word got out that gold had been discovered, technically more up the Fraser River, but a little bit here, thousands of people started coming here, mostly from San Francisco, because they had just had their gold rush. So everyone was super primed and ready for another one. So in the first year of the gold rush in 1858, 30,000 people showed up. 
so if you think about that, literally there was only 200 Europeans living here and there was no real official government. It was just a company. We weren't a province yet. Um, it was the native community and them. So James Douglas writes back to the queen basically and says, we need to make this a colony. We're really nervous that this is gonna become American territory. Basically, most of the island is underneath the 49th parallel. They could have a case to argue that this could be part of their territory. So it becomes a colony of Vancouver Island. It's now governed by the, the queen uh, and James Douglas is not technically the first governor, but essentially he is. Uh, and in 1858, thousands of people just keep coming in and coming in. And a lot of the people that were coming in on those first boats were of Chinese descent because they had been living and working in San Francisco and had made their money there and knew this was going to be the next big thing. So the gentleman in the middle there, uh, his name is Li Kuang. And Li Kuang was one of the first uh, Chinese immigrants to come here in 1858. And he owned a store in San Francisco. So he opened up the Chong Li store here. And essentially he was certainly catering to the Chinese community, but he was also very much similar to the Hudson's Bay Company, bringing in goods and services to kit out these new people that were flooding in here. People needed goods and services and he was providing that. So he was a very successful businessman. His English was quite good um, and people really liked him. So his company at one point rivaled the Hudson's Bay Company in size. Uh, so he was a very influential person. His wife, who's standing next to him, she came about two years later. She was the very first Chinese woman to immigrate to Canada. So the very first one. He then brought, of course, his, grand, his, his, his mother and they had some children here as well. So he funded the building of the school that you see behind you. So unfortunately, um, you know, over the years from 1858 till about, well, mid-1900s, um, they were starting to impl implement a series of very racist policies to try and curb Chinese immigration. And one of those was A, the head tax, so they were charging a fortune for them to come here. Uh, but one of the other things they did here locally was to segregate the schools. So, so they separated the Chinese kids from the European kids. And of course the Chinese community didn't want that. They wanted their kids to have the same opportunity. But there's not much they could do. So uh, uh, Mr. Lee there helped fund the building of the Chinese public school. Uh, technically this was designed by a Scottish uh, architect. Chinese people weren't allowed to be architects here in the city. So they really kind of overly exaggerated sort of the oriental features. This is actually technically more northern Chinese style. Most of the people here were from southern China. But either way, they built the school in 1909, the same year they started building the Victoria Public Market. Uh, and this is where the Chinese kids went to school. Um, by this point, the Chinese community had been living here for years and their kids per spoke perfectly fine English. So mostly they were just learning the same subjects as uh, the other kids. By 1920, the local Chinese community successfully lobbied the government to reintegrate the schools, and they did that in about 1921. This school became an after-school program for the Chinese community, for their kids to actually learn more about their heritage, because at this point, they really were integrated into Western society. And that's still what it is today. Um, it is an after-school program. It is a cultural center during Chinese New Year. Most of the festivities take place here. The building itself, because it's a single standing unit, is definitely a unique and a heritage site here in Victoria. We've got um, three stops down here on Fiskard Street. So we're going to walk underneath the gates of harmonious interest. Uh, these were put in in 1980. Uh, this is when they really revitalized Chinatown. There's a ton of symbolism on there. I won't go into every little piece there, but dragons are a big part of the symbolism. They ward off bad spirits. A lot of phoenix uh, are there as well, a mythical bird. Again, sort of revitalization, rebirth. Um, the stones were donated by our sister city in China, Shouzhou it's called. So this is our next stop. I'm just gonna run in and get the bun. Um, they, essentially, it's just a counter. Um, you're welcome to kind of come in and take a look, but uh, we're gonna take the sample to go. This is Wale Yun. Uh, they do mostly Cantonese, and we're gonna do a steamed bun. favorite place to come and get duck. They have a beautiful barbecue pork duck. They also just have a straight up restaurant, but I would argue they're most known for their barbecue and for their steam buns. This is Israel's business. 
Um, it's fabulous. We're going to try some cool hot chocolate here. Um, but what he's most known for and, and where he started uh, are, are with his tortillas. That's right. Are you okay if you're on Absolutely. camera? Absolutely. Okay, sweet. Maybe I'll pass the mic over to you. Do you have a minute to chat? Yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect. Israel, tell us a little bit more about How are you guys yourself. doing? We're doing uh, so we produce tortillas with a busy organic corn and we do the whole process of uh, uh, what is called nixtamalization, which means cooking corn from kernel to the dough. So that process takes about 20 hours to get the dough processed. So we also grind with lava rock uh, stones. All, all, these, all these stones are um, uh, called basalt and they're very porous. So when they spin together, they actually grind the kernels uh, super, super fine and you get the dough. Uh, we're gonna show you in the back how we right now produce you know, all our tortillas. So we're gonna get you guys on the back and um, I'm gonna show you just uh, how the packages and the tortillas look like. You can find these tortillas in multiple stores in Victoria, as well as we are uh, using our tortillas in restaurants like Cafe Mexico, Glow, uh, a couple of other food trucks like Ay Mamacita in Vancouver, um, Al Pastor Taqueria in Duncan. Um, where, where, where I was just at Niche. I went oh, for happy niche. hour there. There's a really beautiful store just a little outside of town. And we went for their happy hour, and I noticed that you were on their menu. I was like, yeah, yum. <laughs> so we're going to get you in the back, cool. and then uh, we'll show you a little bit of the production. This is what I was talking about. This is the lava rock, and as you can see, they're very porous. And these two wheels, uh, they got attached into this uh, um, grinder. And then we got another one that actually comes in the same way. Right? And then what we do is we attach it together. Just like that. So the kernels, which is the nixtamal, which is already the kernels that have been cooked with calcium hydroxide, we cook it for about an hour uh, with water, and it's only three ingredients in our tortilla. There's no preservative, there's no gums, there's nothing that are foreign ingredients into the tortilla. So we try to keep the integrity of the tortilla as much as we can. So once uh, this is the nixtamal, and as you can see, it's already cooked and peeled and washed. So the, the, uh, what I want to show you here, it's the, um, how at this speed, because for, for horsepower, these motors, so when this spins, the two, the two stones together, so this is the first step of, it just basically smashes. And then when it comes around here, it just grinds. And then from here, you get all the dough. So the dough looks like this, right? And then the key is that when you press down, there's no cracks. It's almost like Play-Doh consistency. It's, it's, it's soft. The rice was ground and the hydration we put into it as well. So we put some water, as, as, we, as we grind, we put the water on it so that it helps the, uh, the grinding process to get, to get done. Uh, and then, yeah, so it's almost like a, like a glue, like very elastic. Well, how about I show you how do we make the tortilla from here? Okay. Yeah? So, we just cook it here and we land it. Oh, it goes right on the yeah, and Willow, Willow is gonna is gonna flip the tortillas for us. Okay. And basically, what happens here is that uh, the tortillas got um, cooked right now, and then she's gonna flip around right now. And you can see the hydration now is coming out of the, the tortilla. Steam. The steam is coming okay. out of the tortilla. So when you flip the tortilla, Ooh, that's awesome. One more time. And what you're looking for is it's, it's uh, a little bit of a 
the more time. So you don't, what is it that you're looking for? You don't time it, you're just, you're just going um, on the way by, it looks? By, by the way it looks, how, how actually how it feels. And then the other thing we can do is uh, show you when the tortilla kind of pops. Pockets of air. Now, the thing about it is that the turkey is flexible oh. and it doesn't crack. And when you open the tortilla, you have the, the you have these parts. Like so right. the cooking of it is just as important as the ingredients. As the ingredients. As the grinding. I mean, every step really is important. Really, really is important. And when you try one tortilla, we're going to get you that tortilla with a little bit of salt. So. Okay. I'm going to show you. You want to have this one? Without salt? Oh, yeah. Without salt. And we're going to give you one with salt. What does the salt do? It's just, it's just what we do in Mexico when we go for uh, tortilla shops is that how they... Um, how do they give it to you? It just adds flavor. It's, an, it's like a, so yeah. They, so you go and get a tortilla in Mexico, they put a little salt on the side. A little salt on the side, yeah. And if the tortilla shop sells uh, salsa, yeah, they put salsa on it too, <laughs> right? The flavor. The flavor is, is just incredible. It's just incredible. So most, most massive produced tortillas are made with powders. And, and, nothing like and that. there's nothing like that. It's like making mashed potatoes with, uh, with a- I'm with never a, gonna with a, be able to eat a store <laughs> I know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know. It's it's hard. It's hard to believe that we, we have been in North America eating those kind of tortillas, which it's, it's nothing. A crime. It's just a crime. <laughs> it's it's. I didn't want to say that, but it's actually a crime. <laughs> the Mexican chocolate comes from uh, Soconusco Chiapas. So this beverage is, should be thicker because it's one of the things in Mexico we we have a first thing in the morning as usual. It gives you a lot of a lot of energy. The cocoa beans give you a lot of energy too. Uh, the dough, what is happening with the dough is also exactly something we didn't we, we didn't touch. Um, uh, we didn't say anything about it. When you nixtamalize corn, corn as as uh, as a grain or as a vegetable you have no nutrients or you can digest corn. The only way you can digest corn is by this this, this process of nixtamalization, which is an indigenous. Uh, practice back in the days uh, civilizations like Mesoamerican times and Aztecs, Mayans, they, they developed this part of uh, the cooking process. And you got calcium intake as soon as you get uh, the nixtamal process, because you use calcium hydroxide, the kernels get calcium in, into it. So your calcium intake comes from the dough, from the tortillas, not from the dairy. Because back in the days there was no, there was no dairy in, in, in that part of the, of the world. So, and then 19, vitamin B2, vitamin B12. Uh, so it's a lot, of, uh, a lot of elements that are, besides just the flavor, actually the, the nutrients that you can get from, from the next amount. And that's why you have it for breakfast, it's better than coffee. Better than coffee. Uh, so he took over the space and it used to just be his production facility. They've literally just opened it up uh, where they're now doing some hot foods. But uh, yeah, some of the like most, like the best restaurants in town are using his product because it's so good. Um, he started making his own salsas, his own mole sauce, he makes his own tortilla chips. Uh, so yeah, it's just a growing step by step by step. So it's really cool to have his unique talent to come to such a small city. This is our next stop. I know you've got a hot chocolate in hand, but you know what's going to go really well with that hot chocolate is a pastry. So bring it on in. This is Rebecca's business. Uh, she started La Rue Patisserie, oh gosh, I believe they're coming up on their five year anniversary. And she essentially worked in the law profession and loved to travel to Paris, loved Parisian bakeries. And when she retired, she actually tried to get a job working as a barista. She just wanted a fun part-time gig. She was loved the scene. And uh, hi. And she basically couldn't get a job as a barista. No one would hire her. <laughs> so she, her and her then business partner decided to open up La Rue Patisserie um, and styling everything uh, kind of on a French style bakery. So she hired a professional baker and her goal was to sort of just be, you know, working in this beautiful shop. She designed everything herself, picked all the colors, made it what she wanted it to be. And then of course when COVID hit, uh, everything went haywire. She lost a lot of her staff. So essentially it's at that point where she decided that she had to teach herself how to bake. But she only wanted to really focus on one item because she's not a baker by trade. So she decided to make their croissants. So she had someone teach her how to make croissants 
and she now makes all of their croissants. But they are most famous for their beautiful French pastries. So we're going to try one of their beautiful French pastries. Um, but this is exactly what the shop is. You come in for a little taste of Paris. Uh, they serve some local tea. Uh, it's from a little tea shop around the corner called Silk Road. Uh, when you order a tea, they literally come out on a silver tray. Uh, they're very famous for their macarons. Uh, but we are doing a beautiful pastry called the Paris Breast. Maybe we'll walk on over to here. Are you okay if I get you a little bit on camera? Yeah, sure. Okay, perfect. This is Rebecca. Hi. Rebecca, this is Paul and Lane. Uh, there's some travel bloggers that are visiting here. Uh, they're super passionate about food. They've been asked some really great questions. Uh, and yeah, they're, we're just having a great time here in Victoria. Yeah. What a beautiful shop. So as I understand it, you did the temperature. I came up with the design, for sure. I worked uh, very closely with a really lovely young lady who was working on her architect. This was her final project to become an architect. And um, yeah, she was great to work with. I just told her all these things and, and you know, all of my travels in the, in the world and she just narrowed it right down and came up with this. I mean, everything from the floor to the floor. Right. Yeah. And I love being able to look into the kitchen. And that was all neat. Absolutely. Perfect. Yeah, have a seat. What are you serving? Though? I am serving you a very delicious treat called the Perry Breast. It's a very traditional French pastry. It's a pastry with hazelnuts. It's my personal favorite too. Yeah, so uh, it actually dates back to the 1890s, this pastry. Uh, it's There's a bike race that goes on from Paris to Brest and Fetch. Um, and so the story, as I've told, is that there was a chef that was supposed to come up with something to represent the race. Um, because it was in France, it had to be delicious. Because it's 1,200 kilometers, it had to be calorie rich. And traditionally, it's a circle to represent the bike wheel. What would be the steps in the um, So the uh, shoe pastry is a cooked pastry. Um, and so... Uh, you cook the pastry and then it go, uh, gets piped and into the oven. And then the filling, and the, it really just acts as, a, it's a very simple, like, um, yeah, it's a simple pastry actually, like the ingredients are simple. Um, to get it look to look nice is, that's the difficult so the part. So the trick is, yeah, the presentation. Yes, like absolutely. Like a plain slate, you yeah. can kind of fill it or stuff it with anything and it acts as like a vessel to stuff it with. Yeah. And and into your yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Alley. So most of these buildings were built sort of in the 1880s and 1890s. That's when Victoria was really at its height. So the gold rush, as I mentioned, started in the 1850s. Um, but most people that came to Victoria in the early days there were just landing here, regrouping, and then leaving to go up to where most of the gold was, which was in the, called the Fraser, Fraser Valley. Um, but by the 1880s and 90s, that gold rush was over, and so a lot of the people that either made their fortunes or didn't came back to Victoria. And that's when these buildings came in uh, in brick. So as I mentioned, this was where the Chinese community settled, and so many of these buildings here, of course, housed the Chinese people. Their businesses operated out of here. Um, by the turn of the century, um, particularly around World War I time, and it, even up into World War II, uh, this became kind of where a lot of the gambling dens were. So gambling, a very popular pastime in the Chinese community, and a lot of it was centered here. And Fantan is the name of a game that they used to like to play. And they played it with dice, and they would bet on like certain numbers. Uh, so the word fan means to turn over, and tan means to spread out. So fan tan is actually the physical, physicality of the game. So one of the reasons why this alleyway proved to be so useful is that gambling was illegal back in the day, particularly in the Chinese community. They didn't want the Chinese people gambling. So it would often get raided. But these buildings, um, if you ever get a chance to go inside of them, they're very narrow. There's a lot of secret little rooms, a lot of secret little closets. And they would actually shut the gates to keep the police out, which would give them time to jump from building to building to escape, essentially. Um, this was also the center of the opioid trade as well. 
So Victoria actually kept opium legal up until uh, 1905. So it had been banned already in Hong Kong, it had been banned in the United States, but they kept it legal in Victoria because they had to pay a pretty big tax in order to, to make uh, opium. And the city was making a ton of money off of it. And they actually didn't really want to ban it, uh, but once they realized that the opium addiction started to spread in the white community, that's when they said, okay, okay, it's a menace, we're gonna shut it down. But this, at one point uh, in the 1890s, was home to 14 opium dens as well. So not just, you know, opium and gambling, there was a lot of businesses that ran out of here, fruit stores, grocery stores, a very thriving community that lived and worked in this neighborhood. This alley wasn't specifically built because they wanted to have an escape route, it just happened to be the city planning. There's a very famous film that came out in the 1980s called Bird on a Wire. It's with um, Mel Gibson and Goldie Hawn. Very famously, there's a chase scene on a motorcycle that goes through Fantan Alley. So after that, it actually started to get a lot of sort of tourism attention. Um, and yes, nowadays, lots of people love to take pictures in here. It's very quaint and cute. Uh, again, most of it was made out of wood when they first started. Of course, um, we didn't, when they first developed, it didn't have a place that made bricks. So everything was built in wood because, of course, we have a ton of trees. So the bulk of the city was built in wood until they started to, like, that is the, one of the oldest photos of Chinatown. You can see it's just a shantytown wooden structure. Um, but as they started to build brick, uh, it became now what we see today. Chinatown a little bit and now we are in what's called Market Square. This is also known as Old Town, uh, particularly there on Johnson Street. This is all kind of old school stuff that was built in the 1880s and 1890s. Um, this was where essentially kind of the red light district was. So let's kind of walk and talk here. We'll at least get it down to the brewery and, and have our last sample and some beer. Um, so this is really where the working class kind of settled. Um, there were certainly more fancy aristocrats, and they were more in the James Bay community, more of the sort of British business owners and British high society, whereas this was very much the working class. There were a lot of industries that operated out of Victoria in its first days. It did make it a very wealthy city. There was a lot of money to be had here, um, but it also attracted you know, a very working class young male population. Roughly about the 1980s, again, that's when our Chinatown was revitalized. That's when they revitalized Market Square and started to put in a bit more business in here. Uh, before that, it was kind of empty, build, em empty in all honesty, and a lot of like uh, textiles. There was a lot of like textile businesses here, more uh, factory stuff, more like industrial businesses operated out of here. It really wasn't until about the 80s where sort of more tourist attractions and shops started. Um, this is everything yeah. I have on tap right now. If you have any questions yeah. about anything, just let me know. I can kind of, do you have a, a little takeout little menu? Here, I'll tell you how, sort of, if you're curious about what this beer is, because there's a lot there. <laughs> two things I'll say about when you look, when you go to a brewery and you're unsure of what beer you should have, there are two numbers that I look at that give you a bit of an idea of maybe what the flavor profile is going to be, although these guys are fairly... They're, they're a very approachable beer, let's put it that way. You're not gonna get anything too, too crazy crazy. They've got some fun stuff. But if you look down below, you'll see ABV and IBU. ABV is, of course, alcohol by volume. So that's the percentage of beer. Now, I love to stay in that 4% range. I'm a lightweight. Um, I also just really like an easy drinking beer. The higher you get, obviously, the more, you know, bigger the beer, typically. Usually those IPAs or the India Pale Ales tend to have a higher percentage. If you like a big, flavor, bold beer with a little kick to it, then yeah, maybe you're looking at that number. The next number that's not quite as known is the IBU. I, have you guys heard that number, that letter before? So it's the International Bittering Unit, and that's essentially how kind of bitter tasting your beer is gonna be. I hate the word bitter, it makes it sound bad. I, bitter can be good if it's balanced. Um, so IBU numbers, the lower they are, the less bitter the beer. The higher the number, so for instance, that IPA, it's at 40, their tropical sour is at two, 
Uh, you can kind of have an idea there of what exactly you're looking at. I think 20 is kind of, a, 10 to 20 is kind of easy drinking. You can see that Scandinavian ale is about 25. So that's another number you can look at. Of course, if you know what style of beer you like, that's obviously another giveaway. Maybe you like those IPAs, maybe you like those pale ales. Uh, Saisons are kind of easy drinking. So that's obviously Stouty McStout Face, great name. That's a dark beer, a stout. So you guys are of course on the Modern Chinatown tour, but we do have our downtown food and city and then our Eat Like a Canadian tour. And then this is our Eat Like a Local card. So this is something kind of we do that no one else does. So these are our some tour partners that we have uh, that offer the discount. You can kind of read where they are. But from today's tour, um, well, unfortunately, 2% Jazz, literally their last day, uh, but Victoria Pie Company, uh, they're on the tour. Uh, I think that's it from this tour. Most of them are from our other tour, which is a little bit more established. Uh, but anyways, this is the card that you show, and then, then you'll get the discount using the card.